Hello and welcome. This is going to be our lecture video for the Unit 5 test review. Let's go ahead and get started by naming some of these ionic compounds. So ionic compounds, we don't need any sort of prefixes. If we see aluminum next to bromine, we can ignore the three and just say aluminum bromide. And because this is ionic, we can figure out that there must be three bromine uh, just by uh, thinking about the electrons. So no prefixes are needed when naming ionic compounds. Uh, so to say aluminum tribromide would be wrong. Also remember to always put that "-ide at the end. All right, now with number two, we see a group. We've got this SO4 group. So this is... Lithium, we just say the first element, even though there's two of them, you just say lithium. And then you got to look up here to find where that, what the name of the SO4 group is. That's a sulfate group. So it's a lithium sulfate. All right. Um, I think you can get the rest of these. One thing that's not here is when we need to use Roman numerals. If we ever have a transition metal, like let's just come up with an example, something like uh, copper, uh, so CuCl2, this would be copper two chloride. Because chloride can receive one electron, so copper must have two valence electrons to make this whole thing balance. So be prepared for some uh, potential Roman numeral questions. All right, now go in the other direction, uh, write the correct formula. So uh, potassium chloride, the ions present, when this dissociates, the potassium will separate from the chloride, but the chloride will keep potassium's electron, giving it a one plus charge. And the chlorine, uh, has seven electrons, it goes up to eight. That extra electron counts for a negative, so it's a minus one charge. So this is just KCl. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Let's try one that's not one-to-one, -one, like calcium chloride. So calcium has two electrons. It loses them both. It takes on a two-plus charge. Chlorine, same as above. But now this doesn't balance. Plus two and minus one don't balance. So what I do is I make it CaCl2. By having two chlorines, I'll have two atoms capable of receiving both of calcium's electrons. All right, now let's move on to these Lewis dot structures. Uh, we'll just do the second one, uh, magnesium iodide. So the cation is the magnesium. Magnesium is going to lose its electrons and take on a positive two charge. Iodine is going to gain that electron and take on a minus one charge. Now here's our Lewis dot structure. It looks kind of funky. For one, we have to put the magnesium in a set of brackets because now it's charged. And it's got a two plus charge. Iodine goes in a set of brackets and it has now got eight valence electrons. So we draw the eight around it, giving it a minus one charge. And we put the two down here to make sure this balances for the exact same reason the calcium chloride, we need two iodine to receive both of magnesium's valence electrons. All right, on to covalent bonding. So in ionic bonding, an electron was transferred and then the atom stayed stuck together like magnets. Now with covalent bonding, orbitals are going to overlap and then share an electron. And that's what will keep our atoms together. This is a much stronger type of bond. So how do we draw it? Let's start with, um, uh, this is carbon dioxide. Now we do have to say that di because it's uh, covalent, so the prefixes matter. Um, oxygen has got six valence electrons. It's only got four orbitals, so it pairs up two of them. I'll just show this paired up on the top and the bottom, two unpaired. Carbon's got four valence electrons, and then this oxygen over here's got six. I put carbon in the middle. We always want to put carbon in the middle. All right, now we bond everything. We still have unpaired, so we make double bonds. And when we clean this up, it looks like this. Carbon in the middle, double bonded to an oxygen, 
double bonded to an oxygen. And then the lone pairs kind of drift away from the negative energy of those bonds. All right, so total valence electrons, let's see, we had six, four, and six, that's 16. Shared pairs, there were four. Lone pairs, there were four. The shape here, there's no lone pairs in the carbon causing these two bonds to bend, so it's just gonna be linear. And the name of this is carbon dioxide. All right, we've seen water often, so let's move on over to nitrogen bromide, or we should say nitrogen tribromide. We do need that prefix now that we're dealing with a covalent bond. So nitrogen's gonna go in the middle. It has five valence electrons and only four orbitals to put them in, so it's gotta partner up two of them. And then bromine will surround the nitrogen. And bromine has got seven valence electrons, so it's got to pair up three of them, having one unpaired. And look, I'm just going to point that towards the nitrogen to make these bonds easy to draw when we play connect the dots. All right, so connect the dots, making sure everything is connected. One nitrogen in the middle, three bromines around the outside. Total valence electrons, let's see, there'd be 21 plus 5, 26. Shared pairs, three. Lone pairs, three, six, nine, ten. The shape, so there's three bonds, so it has to be one of our trigonal shapes. So trigonal, and then we look for a lone pair. We see a lone pair. There's a lone pair in that nitrogen. That's going to force this into a pyramid shape. So trigonal pyramid. And the name for this would be nitrogen tribromide. All right, let's see. Um, that's gonna be the same shape as the PCL3. Carbon tetrachloride is tetrahedral. And N2, which is just dinitrogen, that's going to be linear. All right, uh, name the following covalent compounds. So if we just have um, an element by itself to start it, we can just say that element's name. We don't have to say mono for the first one. So hydrogen. But now for the second one, we do have to say mono if it's one. Mono, and then we turn it from fluorine to fluoride. Hydrogen monofluoride. I'll just do the rest of these out loud. Dihydrogen monosulfide. This is difluorine, which you can just call fluorine, but I like difluorine better. Dinitrogen monooxide. Dinitrogen trioxide. Sulfur dioxide. Carbon tetrabromide. And then just oxygen or dioxygen. I like a little bit better. All right, and then you just go the other direction for these. Uh, when we see just an element by itself, uh, you've got to make it at least a, uh, a Cl2 so that we don't have um, any unpaired electrons. The unpaired will, will pair up here. And then for bromine, it's Br2. All right, on to talking about electronegativity and bond type. When I say bond type, we're introducing this uh, distinction into covalent of nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. The difference being that in a nonpolar covalent bond, the electrons are shared equally, and in a polar covalent, one of the atoms is hogging the electrons a little bit. And polar covalent is sort of in between nonpolar and ionic, kind of has characteristics of both. All right. So uh, phosphorus and chlorine, the more electronegative, let's go find phosphorus and chlorine. Uh, phosphorus is right here, 2.2. Chlorine is right here at 3.0. So uh, the more electronegative is chlorine at 3.0, and it's a non-metal. I don't have room to write that. Um, and phosphorus was 2.2. So 
the electrons are closer to which element? Always the one that's more electronegative. So in this case, chlorine with its 3.0 is hogging the electrons a little bit. The difference in electronegativity would be 0 0.8 if I just subtracted those two numbers. And that bond type, 0 0.8, lands us right about here, firmly inside the polar covalent. So the electrons would still be shared. They don't get transferred until you pass 1.7. All right, chlorine and bromine, they are uh, 3.0 and uh, 2.8. So chlorine again wins at 3.0. Bromine was 2, that's supposed to be 3.0. Bromine was 2.8. So chlorine wins by 0 0.2, but this is much closer. So this is a nonpolar covalent and the electrons are going to be shared equally. I guess for the one above, we should have said unequally. All right, copper and oxygen. Copper is 1.9. Oxygen is a 3.5. So that's getting close, but isn't quite an ionic bond. So the more electronegative was oxygen at 2 point, no, 3.5. Oops. And then copper, which is Cu was 1.9, interesting that some have gotten fixed. So the more electronegative was oxygen. So that's where the electrons are gonna hang out. The difference here is 1.6, which is still just a polar covalent. And that means shared unequally. All right, let's look at a few more on the next page. All right, on this page, we see an example of an ionic bond and it's in the strontium and fluorine. So the uh, more electronegative is fluorine. This is our most electronegative at 4.0. And then the strontium is very low in its electronegativity. No, it's actually SR, it should be an R. It's a 1.0, that's one of our lowest. So our gap here is 3.0, and the electrons are gonna favor fluorine. I'm not sure if I'm using these columns right. Um, and that's gonna make this an ionic bond, which means the electrons are gonna be transferred, fully transferred, meaning the strontium will just lose its um, two electrons and be totally happy uh, and fluorine will gain one and be totally happy. So in general, a covalent bond forms between two non-metals. If we were keeping track of that, we would have seen that typically it's two non-metals, um, although you can get some transition metals and some post-transition metals in there. Uh, the electrons are shared. An ionic bond forms between uh, well, it's a metal and a non-metal, but specifically alkali or alkaline earth metals. But we'll just say a metal and a non-metal. The electrons are transferred. All right, uh, when a bond is polar, we call it a dipole to show the polarity of the bond. For the following bonds, first determine in the bond if the bond, I should say if the bond is polar or non-polar, then if it's polar, draw the dipole and indicate the partial charges. Okay. So uh, A is gonna be nonpolar. There's not a great enough difference there. Um, B will certainly be polar. And we're going to show uh, an arrow here showing that the oxygen is gonna be slightly negative and the copper is gonna be slightly positive. Uh, here's another example of a polar 
this time. Again, going towards the oxygen, which will become slightly negative and the hydrogen becomes slightly positive. Uh, we'll see this later on, not for this test, but I, there's this symbol for slightly positive. It's kind of like a bad S. It's actually a lowercase d, but it means slightly um, negative or slightly positive. All right, when two elements match, it's 100% nonpolar. It's completely equal sharing. And I'll let you do the rest of these. All right, that'll be the, the end of this lecture video. Good luck studying. Have a good rest of your day.